know what, this, this is a good passage of scripture to just repeat again. So if you would look in your bulletin, or if you've got your Bible open uh, to the NIV, so you can say it along with us, let's just say this together, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 to 32, say it with me. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawn and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, as in Christ God forgave you. Now you said it, now you got to do it. We started a few weeks ago a uh, series of sermons that was inspired by a deeply theological and profoundly insightful source, a t-shirt that my daughter bought me in the Italian section, the north end of Boston, and it says, forget about it. Forget about it. And then as I looked at that t-shirt, it got me thinking, there are some things in our lives that we really should forget about, some things that we assume, some, some modus operandi, if you will, that the things that we operate out of that we should forget about because sometimes they're not true or sometimes they lead us down the wrong path or they're just not helpful for us. And so we discovered, first of all, that we should forget about religion. It's not about religion. It's about a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then we talk about rugged independence. Forget about it. You were not designed to be the Lone Ranger, but to live as an interdependent part of the body of Christ. And then we uh, talked about forgetting the past. Not letting our past sins and failures bog us down because if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Today we're going to talk about anger. Forget about anger. What kind of things make you angry? Help me out this morning, okay? Talk back to me for a minute. It, complete this sentence. I really get angry when, for instance, I really get angry when the dog has left a mess on the kitchen floor and my feet discover it before my eyes do. <laughs> yeah. I really get angry when I reach for the jar of pickles in the refrigerator and pick it up by the top only to realize that somebody didn't put the lid on top. I really get angry when I'm really in a hurry and I get behind somebody's grandmother going 20 miles an hour ahead of them. What kind of things make you angry? Come on, complete the sentence. I really get angry when. Help me out here. When you're lied to. Yeah, when somebody lies to you, they don't tell you the truth. <laughs> TV news, okay? Angry at the media and their slant and the way they, they distort things sometimes. When there's only one checkout line open at the Walmart. Only one <laughs> checkout line open at the Walmart. I really get angry about that. Daniel? When you get frustrated, you can try again. Yeah, that's a good word. You want to carry? Um, when people in a customer service situation just say, well, it's your job to do it for me. It's your job to do it for me. Yeah. Yeah. People cop out on what they ought to be doing themselves. All kinds of things. I'm sure other things are going to come to your mind. There are all kinds of things that make us angry. You probably didn't know this, but May 4th was National Explosive Ordnance Disposal Day. I didn't make that up. <laughs> got me wondering, how many people are storing explosive ordnance in their homes, in their businesses? Are we sitting on a powder cake that's just waiting to go off? Well, there is a powder cake that all of us can tend to sit on, and it's called anger. Now, I had planned to preach about this before National Explosive Ordnance <laughs> Disposal Day, but hopefully I'm not too late. So let's talk about anger, but first, let's pray. Lord, as we come into your presence this morning, we pray that you would remold us and reshape us according to your will. We know that we all get angry about a lot of things, and we get ourselves into a lot of trouble when we do it. Teach us your ways, Lord. Help us to be more like you, more loving and more kind. And as we come to your word, Lord, just 
Open our hearts and our minds to everything you have for us. But don't just give us information, dear Lord. We don't just need information. We need your power. We know that your word is not just print on a page. It's not just words in a book or lists of do's and don'ts. But your word is living and active. By your word, you make yourself known to us. By your word, you impress your character upon us. And we invite that. Impress your character upon us now and make us more like you. Hide the one who teaches behind the cross. And in this time, we might see Jesus in him only. For it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. There are a lot of myths that go around in our culture about anger. And the first the most prominent one, I think, is this, that, that our culture tells you, if you're angry, you've got to vent it. You've got to let it out. You've got to express it. These are the same people who will tell you to put out your fire by pouring more gas. Let's look for a minute at what anger does to us. When I get angry, what happens to me? Physiologically, there is a response to anger. My body responds to anger. First of all, that the body creates a rush of adrenaline, and that, that creates the fight or flight response, you know, where, um, where you're, you're either going to, you know, duke it out with somebody or you're going to run away. Uh, the uh, adrenaline um, causes cortisol, which is the uh, hormone that, that causes stress and anxiety. Dr. Uh, Redford Williams, MD, uh, noted that hostility and anger can be fatal because they lead to coronary heart disease and other, other uh, life-threatening uh, um, diseases. When you are angry, your blood pressure goes up. Your blood sugar goes up. Your immune system is suppressed. That fight or flight response is actually a physiological <coughs> response. It's not just psychological. And your body forces more blood to your muscles so that you can respond physically to whatever is going on. And while the blood is being forced to your muscles, guess what? It's not going to your major organs to keep you healthy. And it's not going to another important place. When you are angry, the blood doesn't go to your brain. It's like it cuts your head off, and you can't think straight when you are angry. We are not called to be angry, angry people. We are not called to vent our anger or, or, or feed our anger in any way. In fact, we are called to just the opposite, that we are to control our temper, because when we control our temper and when we control our emotions, uh, that is a much more healthy response for us. Proverbs 29, 11 notes that fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. There was uh, a man driving a Rolls Royce down a rural street in uh, just outside of, of Los Angeles, and as he was slowing down to get around the corner, this shabbily dressed bearded man jumps out in front of his Rolls Royce and yells, PAY! And the, uh, the driver of the car just gets insulted right away, and he yells back, jerk! And he wheels around him and guns it around the corner where he hits a pig that's standing in the middle of the road. <laughs> when we are angry, we don't think straight. We make knee-jerk reactions. Ecclesiastes 7, 7 9 says, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. It only works in the movies to say, no, you need to take your anger, you need to focus your anger, you need to use that anger. You know, and then they do some, some incredible feat or something like that. For most of us, that just doesn't work. When you're angry, you're not thinking straight, and you do stupid things instead. And anger is contagious. We see it in social media. A study was done by Beijing University <coughs> in Beijing, Cal uh, Beijing China, California. Um, <laughs> And they studied the internet, they, they studied social posts and poor emotions, uh, and they studied over 70, 70 million posts, and they found that anger was by far the most influential and fastest spreading emotion. In other words, when you get on the internet, things make you mad, and then you pass them on. And the more you pass them on, the more you're, you're venting your rage, the more you're, you're feeding that rage, and the worse it gets. And one of the the side effects of that is, is that, that there's a toxic side. Uh, one of the side effects of, of that toxicity is, 
is that we've come to accept more crude and violent insults that happen on, on, the, on the web. You know, when, when you're on social media or, or, or uh, not in front of someone, you, you forget people are human beings and you stop treating them like human beings. And what happens is we've gotten more and more crude and rude in the ways that we've responded to people such that we don't even see it anymore. We become numb to it. And that means that if they want to get our attention next time, they're going to be even cruder and even ruder. It just builds on itself. Robert G. Ingersoll noted that anger is the wind that blows out the lamp of the mind. I met a, a DJ from Clayton, Delaware. He told me a story about one of his gigs. Uh, he, he was doing the music for a divorce party. A lot of people celebrate divorce in a party, but this lady had thrown a big shindig to celebrate her divorce. She was finally going to be rid of that guy. And uh, as part of the party, uh, she goes to the garage and rolls out her husband's beautiful, expensive red Corvette. And then she brings out a barrel of baseball bats. You know what's coming. Ladies, have at it. And while they were going in their frenzy of destroying this beautiful red Corvette, the lady's lawyer drives up. And she, she, he says to her, what are you doing with that beautiful car? And she says, that's what he gets for cheating on me. He said, well, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. The good news is you got everything you asked for in the divorce settlement. The bad news is that car is yours. <laughs> We think that it's good for us to vent our anger. We think that if we let go of our anger, then, then, or we let our anger go, then it's beneficial. But in the end, it just hurts us. It just comes back to us. Someone has wisely said, the person who slings mud loses ground. <laughs> the truth of the matter is you don't have to unleash your anger. You don't have to vent it. You don't have to feed it, you can train yourself not to respond in anger. You have a choice. You can't control what other people do. You cannot control all the circumstances of life, but you can control how you respond to them. But you say, oh, pastor, but you don't understand. People make me so angry. I understand. People make me angry, too. People say stupid things without thinking about it. People do dumb things, and it makes me mad. And sometimes it's just nothing that anybody has to do with anything. I get mad in anything. I stub my toe. I get mad at the wall. Yeah, I understand completely. But we can't control all our circumstances. What we can't control is our own response. You're probably familiar with Philippians chapter 4, where Paul talks about rejoicing in the Lord. In fact, Paul commands us to rejoice in the Lord always. Except when we're mad. Well, no, it doesn't say that, does it? It says always. And in fact, he repeats the command, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Well, how are we going to rejoice in the Lord when things just make us so mad? We can rejoice in the Lord because we trust in the Lord. When, we rejoice, when we're rejoicing in the Lord, we're recognizing that we're not in control of everything. But we know the one who is. Do we trust him to be in control of everything? Do we trust that he can handle whatever comes our way? If we really do, then we don't have to get angry. We don't have to worry. We can rejoice in the Lord. Now there's a, a, a word in this passage that I want you to know. If you're looking at your uh, scripture outline, or if you're looking at your Bible in Philippians chapter 4, you're going to read this. Rejoice in the Lord. Always, I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord. Trust in Him. And the promise is the promise of peace. But the word that we miss in the English is the word gentleness. If you notice in verse 5, it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. What does that mean? I mean, I read that, I don't, gentleness, that means I don't push too hard, I don't, you know, I'm just nice to people. 
there's a, there's a really specific meaning to the Greek word here that, that just can't be explained in another word, and it, it's this. This is a picture of a person who is generally gracious and kind and loving and good-natured. And because they are good-natured, there are people who are going to want to just get them angry, who are going to want to needle them, who are going to want to to poke as much as they can to see if they can get anger out of that person, to do everything they can to make them mad, to put them down, to, to cut them off, to, to do whatever they can. But in the midst of that kind of barrage that's meant just to get you angry, I mean, they don't announce that to you. They're just doing everything they can to make you angry and to make you look bad and to, to make you respond in a way that's not part of your character and you don't want to be part of your character. But in the midst of that, when you can continue to return love for hate, when you can continue to give kindness instead of insult for insult. That's what that word gentleness really means. Rejoice in the Lord, trust Him, and let your gentleness be evident to all. That you're unflustered, that you don't have to get mad. Another myth kind of builds on the first one, and that is I don't get mad, I get mad. See, it's been, it's been way too well promoted, because you all know it without any hesitation. I hate when a preacher goes, and they wait for you, because I, I always say the wrong thing. You always said, you just all said the right thing. Don't get mad, get even. But what is getting even? It, it's just venting our anger. That's just one way of venting our anger. And it's a myth, because it'll never happen. We never get even. If you're trying to get even with somebody, it's because they hurt you. They did something that made you angry. And so, getting even means, it means I'm going to hurt them back. And if I'm going to hurt them back, I'm not going to waste my time and try to make it even and make them hurt just as much as I did. They're going to hurt worse than I did, right? And then they're going to get more angry and they're going to do something back to me. And then I'm going to get more angry and I'm going to do something back to them. It never settles the score. You never get even. You just get into a cycle of anger that's never ending. You don't need to get even. You need to get God. Did you forget? You have a big brother who can fight your battles for you. And he can handle them a whole lot better than you can. He is able to know every situation, to meet every situation, and he knows every situation. You know, sometimes we do things to get even and, and we make mistakes because it really wasn't called for in the first place. Or maybe somebody did something to us but they didn't mean it or they weren't aware of it. And, and then we just, we create problems. But God doesn't do that. His justice is perfect. And as Christians, we are told not only that we should not get even, but that we cannot get even. You have no right to get even. You have no right to vengeance. While the world is saying you should take your vengeance, you have to say, I don't have any vengeance. I've given it up to another. Because God is the only one who is able to have vengeance. Romans chapter 12 says this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then here's the kicker. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. But leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. You think he could do it? You think he might have enough might to be able to take care of it? And someday we know that he is going to reap perfect justice in this earth. Until that point, we don't really know how to do it. On the contrary, Paul writes, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. You want your vengeance? Do it this way. Do it with kindness instead of hatred. Do it with love instead of hurt. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. That comes right out of Proverbs, by the way. Uh, Jesus didn't just make that up. Paul didn't just make that up. Um, it, it was already there. You, you want to get back at somebody? Just be so kind to them that they won't know what to do with themselves. My mother used to say, kill them with kindness. That's the scriptural thing. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
overcome evil with good. How do we overcome evil? We overcome it with good. Now, I love the story of Abraham Lincoln. After the Civil War, uh, when some Southern leaders came into his office, he treated them with respect and kindly. He, he let them know that, that they were part of this new nation that they were rebuilding. Uh, and he was so kind that some of his compatriots, uh, when those Southerners left, he said, how can you treat those rebels like that? Abraham Lincoln was wise enough to say, when I make my enemy my friend, I've defeated my enemy. Overcome evil with good. Gentleness. Gentleness is, is something that, that we are called to. Carl Sandburg's daughter, Helga, Helga, wrote about her parents and the household she grew up in. And she writes these words, there were never loud arguments back and forth in our house. Well, my father raged and roared and often, but it was one way. Mother coaxed him out of it. One time when he was very old, I saw him pull at a door that was stuck. He rattled the handle and he shouted. My mother, a small woman, looked up at him, patted his chest. What a fine, strong voice, she said. <laughs> and disarmed, he stood there in love. It was a thread established early and woven throughout their life. You know, it takes two to make an argument. If one person says something in anger or something that's gruff, if the other person responds in love, there is no argument. You've diffused that bomb that was ready to go off. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle, earth, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That's why James writes to us and says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, for man's anger does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. Someone well said, you were given two ears, but just one mouth. And maybe that's because you should listen twice as much as you speak. Uh, man's anger, human anger, does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Think about a postcard we got uh, a few years back. When, when somebody visits the church for the first time, we send them a letter. And in the letter, we thank them for coming, and we let them know that our ministries, our time are available to them, that we are available to them, and we have to have them come back. We also give them a, a postage paid postcard that they can send back to us to let us know what their experience was like among us the first time, because we want to know. You know, we worked hard to train you all so that you know that when people come in, you should say hello, you should welcome them, you should make them feel like part of the family. How are we doing in that? Well, this postcard came back and, and they said they had liked the message, they liked the music, but they were never coming back because of this. Before they even came into the church, they saw a father and a daughter arguing in the parking lot. That was all it took. That, that just ruined the whole experience for them. Our anger never brings about the righteous life that God desires. That's why Paul says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And I'd go beyond that and say, Paul said, figure filthy language from your lips, but even filthy language on social media or anywhere else. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Are you easily angered? The, the little things tick you off? Do you, do you have a short fuse? If that's the case, if you're dealing with anger in your life, it's not anger that you need to work on. It's really never the negative behavior that you need to work on. I need to work on stopping this. How do you work on stopping? But you need to work on something positive. It's not anger that you need to work on. It's love. Because when love is there, anger can be assuaged by that. It, and it takes the kind of love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it is not proud, it is not rude, it does not boast, 
It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love is the opposite of anger. And if you have a problem with anger, you ought to be working on the opposite in order to develop the characteristics of love. Are there some places where you get angry? Maybe you need to take this passage and put it on a card and mount it on your dashboard. So when you start getting angry, it's right there in your face. Love is patient and kind. Be patient. That's somebody's grandmother right there in front of you. <laughs> Be patient. Hey, would it change your attitude toward other drivers if you realized that was your daughter in that car and she's just learning to drive? Would it change if it was your old grandmother who's just trying to get to the grocery store and that's the only place she can go in that car? If you love someone, it changes things. Maybe you need to take that, that little card and post one on the refrigerator because maybe the kitchen is the place where your temper gets short and you get... You know, get to bustling around and get angry with people. Memorize that verse. Pair your behavior to what that verse calls us to be. Can we be loving in the face of things that make us angry? Well, as Christians, we're called to love our enemies. Who ticks you off more than your enemies? I mean, really. You know? <laughs> Your children. <laughs> True. <laughs> so Jesus is giving a worst case scenario. Uh, and I'll, you know. <laughs> Sometimes your children can tick you up more than anything because they have a, more of an inroad to do that. But Jesus is using the extreme when he says that we should love our enemies. Love those who really would make you angry. Love those who are doing everything they can to do things that make you angry. Jesus says this in Luke 6, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. When people curse you, do you tend to, tend to have, think happy thoughts? No, Jesus is giving the extreme here. Pray for those who mistreat you. Not many of us, when we're being mistreated, when we're being treated unfairly, when, when you wouldn't believe what they did, those are the ones we need to be praying for. Those, those very ones. If someone slaps you on one cheek, get mad. Get even. No. Turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. <coughs> Give to everyone who asks you, and anyone who, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others what you would have them do to you. And if anyone ever had the right to lash out. If anyone ever had the right to be angry, it would be Jesus, the Son of God, who lived the perfect life, who did nothing worthy of anyone's anger, and yet they lied about it. They falsely accused him and condemned him to death. And after they condemned him to death, they abused and they insulted and they mocked him and they whipped him and they beat him. They humiliated him. They shamed him. And then they hung him on a cross. We're told through all of it, he remained silent. And there, as they're driving the nails into his hands, Jesus prayed for them. Prayed for those who persecute. Jesus prayed for those who are driving nails into his hands. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Though the world deserved his condemnation. Though we were in rebellion against him in sin. Though we were shaking our fists in his face and saying, we don't want any part of you. Leave us alone. Jesus came to save sinners. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He trusted God, just like we are called to trust God. 
How do you deal with the anger? Deal with it like Jesus. That you love instead of anger. And this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. What does it mean to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters? If it just meant that we were to die for them, we could only do that once. But Jesus is calling for something more here, or something that is continuous here, that we lay down our selfishness, that we die to self, and we live for others, that we love others in such a way. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind. Compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You think about that. Let's pray. And as we go before the Father's throne, we should take a minute and just think of is there some something that has been making you angry that you've been holding on to the anger? Something that you need to forgive? Are you caught in a cycle of vengeance? Today, give that up to God. Say, Lord, I, I'm going to trust you with this today. I'm not going to keep pursuing this. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to try to get even. I'm going to leave it in your hands. And I'm going to trust your word, and I'm going to return goodness for evil. I'm going to overcome evil with good. Take a minute right now and just talk to the Lord about your situation. Lord, we all have things that make us angry. We all have times when we lose our tempers. Well, Lord, make us, as your body, your people, make us more loving. Help us to control our tempers. Help us to respond in love instead of hatred, kindness instead of anger. Make us more like you. We take our angers, the injustices, the, the, the struggles that we have had, we lay them at the foot of the cross. For there we have found forgiveness. Because of it, we would extend that forgiveness and that love to others. In the name of Jesus. So we respond to what God has been 